Hi everybody, and welcome back to Calculus After Dark, our video series where we teach you the things that your teachers don't want you to know. This is another video on integration by parts. Last time, we looked at something which I'll call the tabular method, because we make a table, for doing integration by parts. In this video, we're going to look at an add-on to this method called the box method, and it's going to handle the situation where in between integration by part steps, we want to switch which is our u and which is our dv, or maybe mix them up a bit. An example of this is in the following antiderivative. I want to say find the antiderivative of the natural logarithm. If we use u is our ln of x. This is wonderful because it means we have to take the derivative of ln of x instead of finding its antiderivative. And of course, dx would just be the dv. If we try to write this down in the tabular method style, then what we would do is write our u, ln of x, and we write our function that we multiply by dv, which in this case there is nothing to multiply by other than say 1. So we'll write the 1. Okay, the first step is we take the derivative if I take the derivative of ln of x, I get 1 over x. Now, in the previous video, when we started taking derivatives, eventually we got to 0. That told us when to stop. We're not going to have such luck here. If I take, keep taking derivatives of 1 over x and its derivatives, I'm never going to get to 0. So let's just pause for a moment on the derivative side and look at the antiderivative side. If I take an antiderivative of 1, I get x. Now I know that when I do integration by parts, the first thing will be the uv. So I'd get the x times ln of x. The next thing would be to subtract the integral of v du. Okay, in this case, there's my v, and my du would be 1 over x dx. And that's already going to be 1. All right? And the reason we know it's 1 is because I multiply x times 1 over x. If I didn't multiply it together, I would just have x times 1 over x dx. And I might think, oh, I have to do integration by parts again. But that's what we're going to do here. We're going to do that rearranging so that we don't have to actually do anything interesting anymore. Okay, so I'm going to actually take this x and move it over. And when I multiply it by 1 over x, I get a 1. Okay, so I'm going to move that x over. That's okay to do because I'm just multiplying them, right? It's integral of v du. I'm just multiplying the two. Okay, and if I move that x over, then there's only a 1 left over. And now if I applied integration by parts, I would end up with a 0 on the left and an x on the right. Now, where do I draw my lines? What's my u and what's my v? The answer is, well, this could have been my u, but I changed it. And that's the whole point. When I work within a box, I'm not actually doing integration by parts. So I shouldn't have any lines in the box, right? There should be no diagonal lines. You can only have a diagonal line going into the box. There's a u, there's a v. And I can have one coming out of the box. So there's my new u, and there's my new v. The first time, of course, it's just u times v. The second time through, you have to get a minus sign, because you're subtracting. And so, in the end, any derivative of ln of x will be x times ln of x minus 1 times x which is x, plus our constant of integration. Okay? All right, let me do one more example, because this is a little bit tricky. And we're going to put it together with my favorite integration by part trick, the i trick. All right, our next problem is to try doing an antiderivative for sine squared. This is very similar to the cosine squared derivation. We're going to use integration by parts, but just like in that cosine squared derivation, I don't actually want to do it twice. I want to use that Pythagorean identity, that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, in order to simplify my calculations. So we break it up by making my u sine of x and my dv sine of x dx. Of course, I only write the sine of x and the sine of x. On the left, I take a derivative. That gives me a cosine. On the right, I take an antiderivative. Be careful, there's a negative in front of the cosine. Now, at this point, I could use integration by parts again. 
I'd get a negative sign, and I'd get a negative sign over here. I would actually end up getting something that was not useful whatsoever. But let me go into a box. If I go into a box, now I'm allowed to move these around, right? As long as I'm multiplying them together, I can put them, factor it in any way I like. And the way I'm going to factor this is by putting this negative on the left and getting rid of this cosine, moving it to the right so that I get cosine squared. All right, and I'm going to continue this box a little bit because I want to rewrite this cosine squared as one minus sine squared. Notice, in the box, we are not doing integration by parts. I'm not taking derivatives. I'm not anti-differentiating inside the box. I'm only rearranging terms or maybe rewriting them. Okay, now once I get to this step, I will do another integration by part step. So I'm going to take a derivative of negative 1, which is 0, and I take an antiderivative of 1 minus sine squared. Well, antiderivative of 1 is x, but oh, this was the problem. I don't know an antiderivative for sine squared. But that's where i comes in. If I call my original antiderivative i, then I know that I'm getting down here the same i. Now I draw my lines in. So sine times negative, co uh, times negative cosine, which gets a positive sine in front of it. There are no diagonal lines in the box because that was not integration by parts. That was just me rearranging terms. But I do get one out of the box, and I get a minus sign on it. OK, so what do we get all together? So our i equals negative sine times cosine. And then we have minus minus 1, so those cancel, x minus i. So we get plus x minus i. And now our i trick comes to fruition. We take this negative i, make it a 2i on the left, divide by 2. So i ends up equaling 1 half, yeah, let's rewrite it, x minus sine of x cosine of x. Again, we aren't really doing anything different than the usual integration by parts. The only thing that appears different is we're not writing down all of the u's and the dv's, which in the background we have to know are there. We have to know what each of these things means. But when we're trying to do a longer complicated problem, it is much more, much easier really not to make any sort of a mistake Right? to really keep track of what it is you're doing if you don't have to fill up your page with a lot of repetitions of the same symbol. Okay, So be very careful using this. Many instructors are going to be wary of you using it. Either they don't know the method or they do know the method, but they don't approve of using the method. So run it by your instructor before using it. However, when you're doing mathematics on your own or if you're trying to check some of your work Fair game. Use whatever you can, baby. It's all good. All right, this has been another edition of Calculus After Dark. We'll see you next time.